My skin is black. What you oh. looking My at? My skin. Yeah, I feel so good to be black right now. Welcome to episode 33 of the Black in Fashion podcast. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. I need everyone to go over to the Black in Fashion podcast uh, Instagram. I'm live right now. I probably should put that up so people know. And then we'll get it started. Let's get it started in here. For the people that's in the room, my bad. All right. Head on over to the Black and Fashion Podcast page. I'll be talking about fabric knowledge, fabric content, properties, what to look for, sourcing, and all that jazz. So head on over to the Black and Fashion Podcast. All right. I'm unconventional today, y'all. Y'all be all right, though. We're just going to go with it and make it work. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so... I'm going to jump right in here. I hope everyone's having an amazing weekend. And um, I just want to make sure that everyone's in the room because I want you guys to like drop questions and stuff like that in the question boxes. And I just um, want to be able to give as much information as possible when it comes to like fashion fabrics and like natural fibers, synthetic fibers and all of that good stuff so that you guys are really getting the most out of the podcast. So I've been trying to lean the episodes to be a little bit more educational um, um, I'm still going to have like that conversation component with the podcast where we get a chance to just talk with other designers and discuss some of their success stories and uh, things that they are good at. But I wanted to make sure that I'm giving you guys like uh, a lot of educational components that you're actually learning from the podcast and then that you're able to take away like skills and stuff like that that you can use like in your design experiences. So that's like my ultimate goal for this podcast is just to, you know, to keep uplifting, keep teaching, you know, keep giving out like all of that knowledge so I'm gonna hop right in and I'm gonna start off by just talking about the different uh, I guess component not even compo like the, it's pretty much two different types of fabrics they are natural fabrics and they are uh, synthetic fabrics so I'll start off with natural fabrics um, your natural fabric and I'm what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you like what the what the fiber is what the advantages of it is, what the disadvantages of it is, and then also like what are like the some of the great uses for it. And I think that's gonna be very helpful for you guys. Um, so we're gonna come with our first one, especially black people, because I'm pretty sure somebody in our roots and our ancestors and stuff like that picked cotton. So we're gonna start with cotton. Um, so let's start with cotton. <laughs> so cotton, um, the most biggest advantage is that it's machine washable, it has good absorbency, it's comfortable, it's set on peels, it's uh, very strong, it also dyes well, and then it's also very economical. Never knew about this until the other day, so awesome and lucky for now. Oh, thank you, thanks for tuning in, girl. If you have any questions, just drop them in the box, or no, write them in the comments, because it's hard for me to get that box stuff together. Okay, back to cotton. So some of the disadvantages of cotton is that it wrinkles fast, it dries slowly, it has poor wicking availability, ability, sorry, I know I talk fast. It has poor resiliency, it has poor elasticity, and it has poor recovery. So all of those things meaning that it, you know, it sh when it once it's kind of like bent out of shape, that's it. Like cotton, is, that's why you see like a lot of t-shirts, like when the necklines and stuff like that are all bent out of shape and they wrinkle and stuff like that because they don't have that resilience to go back into um, like elasticity. It has like very, very poor elasticity. So it's not going to jump back. Um, so that's just one of the things that just to keep in mind when you're dealing with like different cotton fabrics and then a lot of the uses are like broadcloth of course cotton all denim is cotton muslin is cotton um veil batiste cutteroy like all of those things fall in like a cotton category um i do think it's one of the easiest fabrics to sew um for sure like it's just easiest because it's smoother it goes into the machine a lot better like you don't really have to deal with it skipping stitches or anything like that like cotton's probably the thing that most people learn to sew with and it's the one that actually um I mean like I said before like is really like the most like economical so overview of cotton is that um of course it grows in like 80 different countries and accounts for 40 percent of the total fiber production in the entire world and the most textile in the world it is worn by every class of people so you know some of the your more expensive fabrics you'll only get like in ready to wear or in couture and stuff like that whereas cotton is so universal that you can wear it no matter what the price not wear it but it's used in every price point of the business like it's the most universally used cotton um another couple like characteristics i just want to point out 
out when, with it is that it is um, very, very durable um, and that uh, it could, like I said, could almost be used for any sewing project. And cotton fibers are alone are not very robust, but they twist and spin together strong to form like threads um, that can be knitted or woven. So a cotton can be a knit and a woven, just depending on how the yarns are spun to make it. So very universal. All right, next one I wanna talk about is linen. So linen is mostly used in the summer, of course. Linen doesn't peel, it's strong when wet, um, it has good abrasion, it's very comfortable, it's an attractive texture, and it's a very good wicking texture. And those are like the advantages of it. Some of the disadvantages of using linen is that it has a very coarse hand feel, meaning like that it's not soft at all. It um, is a dry clean only fabric because it shrinks really fast. It's very brittle, it has very little flexibility. Um, it, shrinks a lot and then it creases and it wrinkles um which if that's the look that you're going for that works out but it's not a great one um, when it comes to like shrinking and crinkling and stuff like that like it's very very hard to iron or press so let's say you wanted to do something that required a lot of pressing i.e anything in the tailoring field like pants um, tailored pants tailored jackets stuff like that in tailoring, you have to really, really focus on pressing, and linen doesn't press well at all, so it will be very hard for you to manipulate and mold linen, which is why you see linen in a lot more flowy garments and not garments that are super duper close to the body because it's really hard to mold linen to the body. Um, some of the uses that you'll see it in is like, uh, like handkerchiefs and like uh, plain weaves and twills and stuff like that. So um, I think that's all I got for like linen. Um, it's very like breathable. So like I said, it's like a summer like fabric and something that you can definitely use, but it's not warm at all. So you probably would never want to use linen in like your winter, fall months. Um, and so let's move into the next one. The next natural fiber I'm going to discuss is silk. Now silk is, has a soft hand feel. It wicks well. It drapes well. It's lightweight. It has very good absorbency. It dyes well. It's comfortable and it's strong. Um, the only disadvantage is that it is dry clean only. It fades really fast. It's very weak when it's wet. Um, it gets like water and it absorbs water and like stain spots very easy. So it's like once those stain spots or water or oil spots are there, it's very difficult to get it out almost almost impossible so you just have to be super duper careful with silk and um it, it has perspiration damage so if you sweat or you perspire a lot and you wear silk tops or anything like that it's never gonna go away it's gonna have like um a peeling on the outside of the fabric and it's gonna leave like a stain in the outside of the fabric like on the underarms and stuff like that so it's not the best fabric i would say if you're gonna be in in a sweat environment or if you sweat a lot is not a good fabric for that um mostly silks are found in your crepes your satins your chiffons um mostly yeah yeah i mean they have silk and cotton blends where they're mixed together but for the most part it's mostly crepes and, and chiffons um silk is one of the harder fabrics to sew i definitely would suggest that you should work with a silk like when you're first learning to sew it's very very lightweight and slippery so like as it goes like through the machine it's very easy to not have straight stitches or um it's definitely gonna wobble you have to make sure you have complete control of silk because of how slippery it is um it's very hard to do multiple details with silk uh, meaning like you know, adding pockets and adding um, collars. And it's just, very, you just gotta be very, very precise. So I recommend working with silks after you have got in like your foot in the door a little bit with like other fabrics like cottons and linens and stuff like that before you transition to silk because what'll happen is you'll end up ruining this fine fabric and silk is on the more expensive side when it comes to like the fabric scale. So you don't wanna go buying silks and thinking you're gonna um, just jump right into projects with it when you're first starting out. I would definitely give myself a little time I made that mistake in college, thought I was gonna make a silk shirt, and I tried to make that shirt like three or four times like in that school year, and I just could not get it at all. And I had been sewing since I was a kid, and I went into a, a sewing class in college and thought I was gonna make a silk shirt, and I was sadly mistaken, I was frustrated. There was a point in time where I couldn't stand silk, and there was a point in time where I was just like hated sewing because I almost felt like defeated. <laughs> Kind of like completely defeated from like trying to mess around with this silk. Um, I think that when some of the other properties that you guys should definitely know when it comes to like uh, silks and stuff, um, that 
when you're cutting, you should try to use a rotary cutter opposed to using like a sharp edge. You can use a sharp edge scissor, but a rotary cutter is just gonna make it a lot easier to get like those straight and like crisp lines. And then also when you're sewing silk, you should probably use like a roller foot opposed to like your regular like pressing foot. It'll help you have more control of the fabric as it goes through the machine, okay? So I think those are like the only things I really wanna point out. Like when it comes to silk, I'm just checking my notes here to make sure I don't have anything as, oh, do not backstitch on silk. It'll ruffle and it'll jack it up at the end. So you only wanna do straight stitches on silk. I recommend only doing fridge seaming on silk. Um, I would never take a serger or an overlock machine to silk because it's just such a fine fabric. It can't take all of that needlework. So I think that's it for silk. I'm gonna move into wool. So wool, I love, one of my favorites. Um, because it's such a great fabric that is like, especially lightweight wools, they can be worn in the summer, they can be worn in the fall, um, you name it. So wool is very warm, it's durable, it also dyes well, it provides insulation, and that's why it's good in you know both seasons. Um, it drapes well, it molds and tailors well, and it's very, very comfortable. It stretches when it's wet, it peels, it attracts dirt, oh, that's a disadvantage, sorry. It stretches when it's wet. We don't want silk to stretch, so that's a disadvantage. We don't like the fact that it peels, um, that it attracts dirt, it felts, it stretches when it's wet, and of course it's dry clean only. So with wool, you could do many, many different things. It literally, when I tell you, like it's one of the best fabrics to mold, you could probably make anything with a lightweight wool. Probably not like a thicker tweed wool or something like that that you can you would use in coating, but in the lightweight wools, you could do like really dope dresses and tailored pants and tailored jackets and things with like a whole bunch of details because wool, you can pretty much manipulate wool to do whatever you want it to do and you'll make such amazing things from it and even like from the draping aspect of wool, like you literally can curve and fold and manipulate wool and create like your own textile from wool and it is freaking amazing um one thing that is used for a lot is knits coats um suit fabrics tweeds twills flannels um crepes and worsted so that's like some of the, like the really big components when it comes to wool um I love wools. Like I said, it's probably one of my favorite go tools. It's easy to cut. You don't have to use a rotary cutter with wool. You definitely can use like a straight edge scissor for wool. You can use a presser foot, a roller foot. It really does not matter. Like it is probably like on the same level as cotton as far as it being like one of the easiest things to work with. So that's just something that I just got. Just keep in mind when you're working with this, um, these are just like your basic four natural fabrics that, you know, fibers that everyone is like a go to and that everyone should know as a designer, okay? So I'm gonna flip over and I'm gonna go to synthetic fibers um, and the ones we probably use the most. Um, a lot of us out here, um, I did a poll this week. It, it was very interesting. Um, and in the poll, I asked people that they like uh, to use natural fibers better or that they like to use synthetic fibers, like techno fabrics better. And everyone said natural fabrics. And I was gonna be like, y'all lying, like straight up. Because like a lot of the fabrications like in the garment district is all like polyesters, it's all synthetics, it's all like blends and all of it is man-made fibers. And a lot of time when we go into the garment district and we go shopping, the content is actually not even on the garments. So I thought it was very interesting when everyone that, uh, and even people that I know was coming like oh yeah I like to work with natural fabric natural fabric but it's like I've seen you guys work and I and I know for a fact that you don't you may like to work with natural fabrics but you fall into the synthetic category more and that's absolutely fine there's nothing wrong with synthetic fabrics they are made to be more resilient and they made to be able to mold and to do things so just be don't you know, feel some type of way that you're choosing synthetic fibers over natural fibers when, you know, a lot of times the synthetic fibers does make more sense for what you're trying to accomplish. So I just want to tell y'all that I just thought that the poll was very interesting. Um, I also did another poll this week um, on my page where I asked everyone if they designed their garments first and then they actually um, chose the fabrics or do they go fabric shopping get inspired, look for things, and then design into the fabrics. Now, um, a lot of people tell me that they design first. Uh, literally, the poll was like almost like 90, 90, 90, 10, like 90% to 10% of people who always design first, and then they actually um, go and find their fabrics. Now, most people, 
I also did a sorry, let me just take it back one more time. I also did a poll on um, if you were a self-taught designer or if you went to school and you designed because there is a big difference. There's not a right or wrong, but just it's just different the way the process flows when you're self-taught versus if you're school taught or if you've like worked in the industry as well. So I can tell the people who design first and then go into their fabrics are people that were self-taught because that's not the way it's done in the industry, nor is it the way that's taught in a school setting. And I'm just gonna tell you why, not to say that this is the right way to do anything, but the reason why it's done that way is because as a designer, you have your standard, your silhouettes, what you're known for. So you're, as a designer, I wouldn't say it's the smartest thing to do to completely recreate every season. Like you're not going to complete, you're going to have your, especially when you first starting out and my podcast is geared to people that are just starting out in new brands. So when you actually start designing and you're doing a collection every season, you're not going to completely recreate new silhouettes every season. You're going to update and change and alter your key pieces in your collections. And by doing that, you're updating and altering them based off of new technology within fabric or new design details. And that's why they have these trade shows and fabric resource shows all over the world is so that they can introduce you to all these different new technologies when it comes to fabrications and trying something new. So it's, Better, not the best, because I don't want to sound like this. I'm telling you how to, you know, design. But if you go and you research fabric first and then bring that fabric into your design, it's just going to make you it's going to make your collections more cohesive. It's going to make your brand more cohesive because you already have those staple silhouettes in your brand. You already have the things um, that people know you for. So all you're doing every season is when you're going on and creating more and creating more is you're updating based off of like new technologies or different things and finding fabric that like is like water resistant or finding fabrics that uh, have like three and four way different type of stretches that sucks you in. So that's what you want to gain as a designer is creating new textiles and bringing new textiles and new fabrics into your brand opposed to changing your silhouettes there are it's, it's not as many it's not that many silhouettes in this world where you need you, you're gonna always come up with something new you're absolutely gonna come up with something new if it's avant-garde if it's couture but if you're a ready-to-wear designer there's there's only so many silhouettes like with pants there's only so many silhouettes with skirts and dresses and jackets and stuff like that that are actually wearable in the industry so as a ready-to-wear designer which is where i feel a lot of uh, a lot of new designers are leaning more towards that category definitely keeping and keeping your mind that you should always be looking for the the latest fabric technology you should always be looking for like the fabrics that are trending or in the market and stuff like that even if you are a trendsetter that's absolutely fine but you can create your own textiles too if you have the fabric knowledge beforehand before you start designing and then it'll help you design better because you sketch a design first and then you spend hours on end trying to figure out how in the heck or what type of fabric am I going to use for this whereas if you go the opposite direction it'll make it a lot easier as far as like designing into your fabrics um so I just just want to throw that out there just like to give you guys a little information on why you should kind of do it the, in reverse opposed to designing first um because like I said, you want to keep your silhouettes consistent. You want to keep your brand integrity consistent. Like whatever your vision and your mission and your brand identity is, that's just stay consistent. So if each collection you're doing something completely different from the what you did before because you're redesigning every collection, you're not consistent as a designer. And when you're not consistent as a designer, you confuse your customer. And when you confuse your customer, you don't get that brand loyalty that you're looking for. So just want to make sure you guys know that. Um, so I'm going to move into like some of the components of like synthetic fibers. So the first synthetic fiber that I'm going to discuss is rayon. Um, some of the great advantages of rayon is that it has very good absorbency. It's lustrous, soft, and silky. It dyes well. It drapes well. It retains shape. Um, and it seldom peels. Um, some of the disadvantages of rayon is that it is a progressive, it has progressive shrinkage. Like it literally has, it has no elasticity. It's like once you pop it in a dryer, which you probably should just stay away from the dryer with rayons, it's done. Poor elasticity, poor resiliency, and then it's also a dry clean only fabric. Um, you'll always find rayons like mixed with like linen and cotton fabrics um, as linings and stuff like that. We use rayon a lot um, in linings, a lot of like stretch linings and stuff like that because it's very, very lightweight. Um, 
Sorry, I had to take a drink of my coffee. I've been talking so much. <laughs> cool. Okay. So um, next one is I want to talk about is acetate. Acetate is very flexible. It uh, drapes well. It's very luxurious. Um, it has a very smooth hand feel, so it's very, very soft. Um, it has no peeling at all, and it has very, very good and rich colors. Um, disadvantages is that it fades quickly. It shrinks. It has poor elasticity. It has poor abrasion resistance, which means like it's, it scratches really easily, and then it like dis the color gets dis disadvantage. Disadvantage is that even the right word? Once it has, when it doesn't have good abrasion, it just means that it, it gets really, really rough in spots. Like it doesn't good, it doesn't get good with like with mixing together. Like rubbing against another fabric would like change the color of it, if that makes more sense. Um, and then it's also a dry clean only fabric. So you'll find acetate um, in taffetas and satins and brocades um, and tricots and then in like in silk like fabrics. So it'll look like silk and it'll kind of feel like silk, but um, it will be slightly heavier um, with acetate. Um, and it won't have like the, the sheen like it has in like silk, okay? Next one is polyester, which is like, <laughs> so freaking universal because you can pretty much make polyester look like anything and that's one of the advantages of polyester not all polyester is bad there are some polyesters out there that are amazing have great um, resiliency has everything so some of like the key components of polyester is that it is durable it is strong it has good resiliency it has excellent abrasion it uh, is like wrinkle resistant it's an easy care and retains shape and it's flexible so Polyester, I know it always gets a bad rap often and people say negative things about polyester, but polyester is like right up there with cotton as far as like universally being used everywhere because it's a man-made synthetic fiber, so you can make it do whatever you need it to do. Um, and in some silhouettes and in some design, that's exactly what you need. You need a fabric that is actually going to be able to do exactly what you need it to do, opposed to trying to do everything in a natural content and then it doesn't work. Um, it has very little disadvantages. Literally, it peels a little bit. It has a low absorbency. And then, of course, it's, it's the only fabric that has a static electricity. So if you ever touch someone and they had on a garment and you were shocked, it's because of that. It does. That's one of the disadvantages, like the static electricity from it. Um, it's often used in double knits, um, permanent pressed fabrics, um, and it's often blended with cotton. You will get a lot of poly cotton blends. Um, I don't know how many of you guys, when you go out shopping, you actually look at the uh, content of what you're buying or what type of fabric it is. But I do encourage people to take better care of their garments and really look at the label and what they're made of and know how to care for them and how to take care of them only so that we're not wasting so much and that all of these clothes um, from these fast fashion really tailors don't end up in landfills and end up in bad places because we're not doing the work to take care of them. No matter the amount of money that you spent on a garment, that's still your money is spent and that dollar counts and you should take more pride in what you purchase with your money and take care of your garment so that we don't have like all of this waste. We want to create a, uh, an environment where we have zero waste okay um the next fabric that i want to talk about is acrylic um is also the things that us girls put on our nails because you can like i said you can mold it to do so many different things that is made in clothes and we put it on our fingernails too <laughs> so it is very is good wicking um it resembles wool um, it's very durable, it has a soft hand feel, it's machine washable, it's warm, and it has like moderate abrasion. Um, some of the disadvantages of um, acrylic is that it, it peels, it's pretty weak, it has low absorbency, um, it has static elasticity as well, it shines with wear, um, and then it melts if the iron is too hot, which is why you know how when we go get our nails done, it's dipped and then it's laid over because it has like that melting effect. Um, you'll see it a lot with wool and fur like fabrics for sure. Um, so those are like the, I just wanted to give you guys the four like key, key components when it comes to, um, cre uh, uh, sorry, when it comes to fabrications and stuff like that. And then I just want to throw out like, I know that just this, I've been using a lot of different terms. So 
I just want to got, give you guys like some terminology. So when I say like absorbency, if I say acetate, if I say acrylic, so that you guys know. So when I say absorbency, it's like the ability of the fabric to take in moisture. Absorbency is very important property, which affects uh, many other characteristics such as like skin comfort, static buildup, shrinkage, stain removal, water repellency, and wrinkle recovery. So those are like some of the key things. So I know you guys heard me say whether it has weak or low absorbency. That's what I mean when I say that the absorbency is greater or is not. Um, I just was talking to you guys about acetating and acrylic, so I just wanted to get a little deeper into this these man-made fibers. So acetate is a manufactured fiber formed by a compound of cellulose. It's refined like from cotton linters and or a wood pulp, and the, acid, uh, the acidic acid has been extruded through a spinner and then it's hardened, and that's how you make acetate. I know that might be a little bit complex, but you guys get it. And then acrylic um, is a manufactured fiber derived from um, polyliterin and is a major property. It includes a soft wool-like hand um, machine washable and dryable, excellent color retention, solution dyed versions have excellent resistance to sunlight and chlorine degradation. So that's like how acrylic is built off as well. Another of the key terms that I was using that I think you guys should definitely know is, I said say this a lot. What else did I say a lot? Talked about cotton, corduroy, color fastness, yeah, double, elasticity. Okay, so elasticity is the ability of a fiber to or fabric to return to its original length, shape, or size immediately after removal of stress. So that's anytime anything is pulled out or distressed in any way, that's what I mean when I say whether it has good or bad elasticity in it, okay? Um, another one that I was speaking a lot about is like, I say fiber a lot. So the word fiber actually means the basic entity, either natural or manufactured, which is twisted into yarns and then used in the production of a fabric. So that's what I say, that's what I mean when I say fiber. So I just wanna make sure you guys know what that one is. Um, or when I say hand feel, so the hand feel is the way that the fabric feels when it's touched. Um, terms like softness, crispness, uh, dryness, uh, silkiness are all terms that like describe the way the hand feel of the fabric is. Okay. Um, another thing that you guys definitely should know is, let's see here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Microfibers. Now. The name given to a microfiber is ultra-fine manufactured fibers and the name given to the technology of developing these fibers. So, fibers made using microfiber technology produce fibers which weigh less than 1.0 denier. So, the fabrics made from these extra-fine fabrics provide a superior hand and a gentle drape and an incredible softness. Comparatively, microfibers are like two times finer than silk. So, basically, three times finer than cotton and eight times finer than wool. And then, a hundred times finer than any like human hair. So currently there are four types of microfibers like being produced and these include acrylic microfibers, nylon microfibers, polyester microfibers, and then rayon microfibers. So those are things that um, I think that everyday designer should know and um, just take into cap that fabric knowledge is something that is like sometimes looked over. Like a lot of times we just go with what we like and what we see. And a lot of times we don't do the work to understand these things. And I think that it is so crucial to really, really understand um, the way these properties are made, what goes into the making of them. So you as a designer, and when it comes to the integrity of your brand, you can really speak to the fabrications and why you use the fabrics that you use. So just like simple little uh, tips that I just like to throw out there um, for um, just to make you like a better designer and to just to, you know, put different, like, thoughts and stuff like that in your head. Um, I know I was talking about polyester earlier as well. I just want to get a, a, just a little deeper in that as well. Um, it's a manufactured fiber. Um, it was in, introduced in, like, the 1950s, and it's, like, second only to cotton in worldwide use, which is what I was saying, and that polyester has very high strength. So don't be afraid to use it. And although somewhat lower than nylon, like it has excellent resiliency and high abrasion resistance. So low absorbency allows the fibers to dry quickly. So a lot of times with like polyester garments, you never have to put them in the dryer. Like you could just wash them and they'll be dry, like probably with the, uh, within an hour. Like that's how fast polyester dries. Like if you were in a club and you got something on you and someone spilled a drink or something like that, like, and you had on like a, a something that was like 100% polyester, like it's gonna like dry like that and it's gonna be done. Um, and 
won't even have to like go to the bathroom and like dry down and like that. Like it literally can like air dry in like, you know, 15 to 20 minutes if that. Um, wanted to make sure you guys know what resiliency is because I know I've using that word a lot as well So it is the ability of a fabric to spring back to its original shape after being twisted crushed wrinkled or distorted in any way so that's you really really just like stressing the fabric and um, The way that it comes back to you and that's when I speak about resiliency, which I do speak about resiliency a lot um, I talked about silk a lot. I just want to tell you guys like where silk comes from and why it's like one of the most expensive fabrics you will buy. Um, it's a natural filament fiber. Um, it's produced by the silkworm and the construction of a cocoon. So most silk is collected from like cultivated worms, like Tusa silk or wild silk is tends to be a little bit thicker, but a, a shorter fiber produced by worms in their natural habitat. All silks come from like Asia and, uh, and primarily in China. Well, that's a good thing to know there. Um, what else do I want you to go? I think someone actually asked me this week what was like a great book to learn fabrics and something like that that you can um, like buy on Amazon. So the one that I is like my go to is um, Fabrics A to Z. It's the essential guide to choosing and using fabric like for sewing and stuff. It has a lot of information in here. I don't even know if you can guys can see that well, but I'll definitely put it in the show notes as well. That's one of my favorites, and um, you can buy that online. It's by Dana Willard. Um, you can also pick it up at Mood um, or any like um, store, like designer, like fabric store that has like books and stuff like that for sale. It's definitely um, gonna be there. It's one of the hot ones. <laughs> Um, uh, let's go a little deeper into wool, um, cause I'm just, I just going back over some of the things that I discussed, but like giving you like a little history as well so that you know, like what's from. So I'm just going to throw back into wool and wool is a usually associated with the fiber or fabric made from the fleece of a sheep or a lamb. So however, the term wool can also be applied to all animal hair fibers. So including like the hair of like cashmere, angora goat, or specialty hair like fibers of like camel alpaca um, and a llama and a, a vacuna. So those are like, like some of your basic like wool properties. Um, know what they are, know what type of wool it is when you're using because there's so many different ones. My friend, my favorite is like merino wool. It's like so soft. It's like the first cut of the sheep. So it's like the softest wool that you can get. Um, what else do you need to know? Also need to know like the differences, I guess, between like, um, well, well, let me go to just like wrinkle recovery really quick. So when it comes to wrinkle recovery, it's similar to like resiliency. Uh, it has the ability of the fabric to bounce back after it's been twisted and wrinkled and distorted in a way. So like the wrinkle recovery and the resistance, like resiliency of fabric is pretty much like the same thing. So they use the terms differently, but I'll tell you, they're pretty much like the same thing. I do think it's a big thing that you guys should actually know the difference between woven and knits. Um, woven fabric um, are composed of like two sets of yarns. So one set of yarn is the warp, which runs through like along like the length side of the fabric and then the other set of the yarns is the the feel or the weft of it so it is like perpendicular to the warp so woven fabrics are held together by weaving the warp and the feel yarns underneath one another so a lot of times with woven fabric they have because the yarns some are lengthwise and then they're woven together like perpendicular to the other one that's why uh, woven fabrics have very little stretch and when it comes to woven fabrics, it's just like a rule of thumb. Um, when it comes to like sizing, when it comes to like woven fabrics, I always recommend that you stick in numerical because of the lack of stretch that it has. When you have woven garments, you should always stick to like zero, two, four, six, eight, or if it's juniors, then it's like five, seven, nine. And those should be your numbers when it comes to things that are woven because of the lack of resiliency. Now, when you're dealing with knit fabrics, of course you can do alphabetical. So you can do your small, medium large because there's a lot more resiliency in those fabrics and the way that a lot of the knit fabrics are created um is like the weaves are spun opposed to like them actually being like like woven like so instead of it being like perpendicular and one going across like a woven a knit is spun like in a circular motion and that's why it's able to have that stretch but just to be even more specific fabrics made from only one set of yarns so all of them are running in the same direction so some knits have their yarns running along the length of the fabric while others have the yarns running across the width of the fabric so knit fabrics are held together by the looping of the yarns and um, they're all around each other so like knitting creates like ridges and like resulting fabrics which whales are the, the ridges like well whales are the ridges that run lengthwise in the fabric um cor courses run crosswise if that makes sense i hope that makes sense um, 
I know that um, this is a lot of information, but I just like to put it out there, you guys. I really hope that like when I do, you guys are like taking notes on some of this stuff and taking it into part because this is like free game. I'm giving you a free game. I'm giving you a whole fabric class right now, oh, like on stuff. So I really, I really hope that I know that sometimes I can maybe give up a, a, a lot and then some people get into like information overload or they get intimidated but just you take it one step at a time especially when it comes to these fabrics it um takes time you're not going to learn everything like overnight it's definitely going to be something that you have to keep referring back to even myself like I have to go and check back and use my my fabric books as a resource guide sometimes because even after all the years of doing this and working with different fabrics um it's just so many different components and then there's so many different new new fabrics is coming out and new synthetics and all type of things and a lot of these blends and technology technological fabrics that you'll never stop learning it's always going to be something that is going to be learned over and over and over again um I do want to talk a little bit about interfacing because I didn't get a chance to discuss interfacing beforehand. So interfacing is the fabric that we use to support, reinforce, and give shape to fashion fabrics and sewn products. So often placed between the lining and the outer fabric, it can be made like from yards or directly from fibers. Uh, it may either be in woven, non-woven, or knitted fabrics. Um, some interfacings are designed to be fused and adhered like from like a heat and an iron, and some can be sewn in, um, but it's meant to be be stitched right into the uh, a fabric. Um, a lot of times, interface and a lot of times, all the time. Interfacing should always be in things that require more structure, like collars. There should always be interfacing the collar because that's the way they sit up, that's the way they stand, that's without them like having to move. It should always be in the lapels of jackets. It should always be in like button placards to reinforce buttons. It should always be in like cuffs. For sure, like just anytime you have a cuff, it definitely should have interface in it just so that it also like has that structure. It should always be in like waistbands, like always have interface in the waistbands. And that's how you stop waistbands from like rolling over. Of course, you can put um, elastic in waistbands as well if it was like a legging or something like that. But if you're dealing with like a pant or a tailor pant in any way, it should always have like that reinforcement like in your waistband as well. I think that's a good one to always know. What else do you guys need to know? I feel like someone else asked me a question about different fabrics from different countries. It just kind of depends, like, where you get it from. But that's why you really, really do have to, like, just do the homework and do the work behind it. As far as, like, the differences, there's, depending on where it's grown, depending on how, like, the... Um, supplier of the fabric or the mill how they actually treat their fabrics once they um start it, it just kind of depends so it's like there is no one country is better than another country or one meal is better than the other meal it just really does depend on the process on how they actually created the fiber of the content and then um you can check but like if you're working with a meal you should know like how they're producing their fabrics and what they're doing and you should be meeting with your meals and talking to them and really understanding like their process and once you understand their process you can decide whether or not you want to work with them or you don't want to work with them so I think that's all I have for you guys today um I pretty much talked about all of synthetics I talked about like your key natural synthetics your key natural um fibers and I discussed a lot of the different terminology that we use when we're looking for fabrics and what we need to know. Um, I don't think that there's anything in particular that I did not mention that's like a, a key go to and key things that you should know as a designer when you're sourcing fabrics. Um, and yeah, I mean, get the book, Fabrics A to Z. There's another book called uh, Fabrics and Fashion Design that I really, really love. If you do wanna get a little bit more deep into fabric knowledge and terminology and stuff like that, I do all for fabric knowledge courses and you're welcome to reach out to me if you're interested in taking any of those courses. Well, the best thing to do is probably to um, take the book and when you do to the more of like the textile side of things, you should definitely um, read up when you're going to be doing like dyeing and stuff like that. That's the time when you really want to know like all key components and stuff like that when you get into like dyeing fabrics and stuff and when you get to creating dye baths and tie dyeing and dip dyeing and all that stuff. That's when you really want to get more into the scientific part of uh, design and uh, design of the fabrics. But I think that's all for today. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. I hope that you learned a lot from this episode. I think I gave out some pretty good information here. And if you guys have any 
further questions or comments or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, put them in the comment sections. Put them in the email, um, the Black and Fashion Podcast at gmail.com. Also will be in the show notes as well. And I will talk to you guys next week. Have an amazing Sunday and happy designing. And as I always say, stay black. Peace out.